Once upon a time, a guy named Jon Snow identified a threat, convinced everyone it was real, then successfully defeated the threat, improving lives, ensuring a safer future for the world. That threat, of course, was contaminated water and diseases like cholera and typhoid. What, were you thinking about White Walkers? Wrong Jon Snow. See, people were getting their water for drinking, cooking, bathing, and everything else from whatever water source was nearby. Lakes, rivers, wells, and the same pond their pigs were using to cool off on hot days. And then they started getting sick. Until Snow, the British doctor, not the Night's Watchman, figured out that contaminated water was at the heart of the problem. London started building systems that would filter water coming into the city from upstream and release waste downstream. Meaning London had clean water, but whoever lived downstream was SOL, pretty literally. These days, we're not doing things much differently. Sure, we know a little bit more about hygiene and not drinking from pig ponds, but we still like to ignore what's happening downstream. If we want to understand what's going on with water these days and what could happen in the future, we need to know where our water's coming from, how we're using it, and where it's going. Because we are the watchers on the wall, and we have a water problem. Hi, I'm Miriam Nielsen, and this is Study Hall Sustainability. On Earth, all the water we've got is all the water we've got, and that water is constantly moving through the hydrologic cycle. Liquid water in reservoirs like the ocean, rivers, and lakes, but also in soils and vegetation, evaporates or transpires from the surface into the atmosphere, where the water vapor can move from one area to another. The water falls back to Earth by condensing into liquid water and ice, forming clouds and precipitation like rain or snow. This precipitation refreshes glaciers and freshwater bodies, feeds plants, and runs through the soils, tops up groundwater systems, and also, statistically speaking, because the ocean is just so massive, drops into the ocean, ready to evaporate again. Because Earth is the way it is, different areas have different amounts of water, and different areas get different amounts of precipitation. One of the driest places on Earth, the Atacama Desert in Chile, gets just 0.03 inches of rain each year. Meanwhile, the village of Masanram in northeastern India is considered one of the Earth's rainiest places, getting around 470 inches per year. Because of climate change, precipitation levels are also changing around the world. Some places are experiencing more frequent or longer droughts, while others are getting rainier. Plus, more and more people are moving to areas without much water. In the United States, 2.8 million people have moved to areas that experience frequent droughts since 2012. In that same period, the population of Maricopa County, home of Phoenix, Arizona, grew 14%. And all of that change affects people in a lot of ways. But that's not the problem we're talking about. Even without climate change or populations moving around, we'd still have a water problem. Kind of like how the White Walkers were coming regardless of who was on the Iron Throne. That's because we all need fresh water for refilling our emotional support water bottles, cooking, bathing, growing food, and more. But even in places with lots of rainfall and rivers, not everyone has access to enough water to do those things. And sure, things like droughts or living kind of far from a river can make it challenging to access water. But the bigger issue is people. People are in charge of managing water resources, providing the infrastructure to make sure everyone has access to fresh water, and allocating the water in rivers and lakes and human-made reservoirs to all of the homes and farms and businesses that need it. And we've done kind of a bad job. Today, about one in four people around the world lacks consistent access to safe water. Scientists estimate that by 2050, more than 5 billion people won't have adequate access to water for at least one month a year. In all, less than 1% of Earth's water is A, not salty, B, not frozen, and C, available at the surface for living things to use. And agriculture around the world uses about 70% of it. Meanwhile, only about 12% of that water is used by households, and it's not distributed evenly. While people need around 20 liters of water per day for basic survival, the average person in the U.S. uses 310 liters. And that disparity is because of a combination of factors, mostly related to human actions and decisions that have left many areas without adequate infrastructure, or because governments and industries have overused and overallocated the fresh water that is available. And that leaves even less water available for everyone and everything that needs it. For instance, the Amazon rainforest is one of those places that seems to have plenty of water, and it holds about 20% of all the world's freshwater. But just like the White Walkers could eventually make it to King's Landing, even the wettest places aren't safe from water shortages. Over the past few decades, lots of those wet trees have been cut down to make room for things the Brazilian government deemed more important, like mines and cows. Combined, agriculture and mining account for around 70% of Brazil's total freshwater use, and often leave rivers and lakes polluted with chemicals and waste. In 2019, when the government relaxed deforestation regulations so these industries could grow, deforestation sped up by 75%, which is obviously a lot. The decisions made by the Brazilian government and big cow-loving businesses have fueled drought conditions in the Amazon. And in 2023, the Rio Negro dropped to the lowest levels ever documented, interrupting transportation and food and water supplies for communities that rely on the river. People make these kinds of decisions in places with a lot less water, too. Arizona is one of the largest alfalfa producers in the world, and it's a big business for Arizona's economy, generating more than $680 million in 2022. But alfalfa is also one of the thirstiest crops on the planet, right up there with almonds and rice. Using all that water for alfalfa affects Arizona's water supply, which is depleting due to droughts, the growing population, and overallocation of the water in the Colorado River. 
But just like London's sewage affected people downstream, Arizona's water management also impacts the water of surrounding areas like California, Mexico, and the Navajo Nation. Despite being larger than states like West Virginia and Maryland, 30% of the households in the Navajo Nation lack running water because the state of Arizona is blocking their access and making it difficult to negotiate agreements about water rights. The Navajo Nation sued Arizona over water management practices, but lost when the Supreme Court ruled against them in 2023. And all of this is happening right now, but it's not just a matter of how water usage affects residents today. The way we manage our water now also has big consequences for future generations. And using up water before it can get downstream, whether that's to California or the people and cows of the future, is just one part of the problem. We're also polluting the water that is flowing downstream. Since Jon Snow's time in London, we've learned a lot about how to make sure we're not just sending our sewage to the next town over. Now we have a lot of government regulation to protect downstream communities and ecosystems. For example, in 1972, the United States government passed the Clean Water Act to regulate the discharge of pollutants into the country's water and waterways. Under this act, the government provided funding so cities could build or improve their water treatment plants, and it required permits and established certain standards for how facilities could get rid of sewage and other contaminants. But that act hasn't solved everything. Industries like agriculture and mining use and pollute a lot of water. Nitrogen and phosphorus from fertilizers can leach into the soil and groundwater and run off into our rivers and lakes, causing huge problems for freshwater ecosystems. For example, fertilizer runoff into bodies of water can feed harmful algal blooms that block sunlight and deplete oxygen in the water, killing fish and other organisms. Every year, 56% of the water we extract from lakes, rivers, and the ground around the world ends up back in the environment as farm drainage or wastewater from households, cities, or manufacturing. And 80% of the global wastewater goes untreated, which means all those pollutants end up back in the water cycle. So we're gonna need some dragon glass and valerian steel. While some argue for conservation solutions like limiting water usage for households and industries, there are solutions for cleaning up our water too. Which brings us back to the kingdom of the north. I mean, the southwest. Back to Arizona. People living in what's now called Arizona have had to creatively manage the state's water resources for millennia. Long ago, Otham people built a system of canals that redirected water out of the rivers and into their villages. That way they had clean water to drink and grow crops like maize, beans, and squash. The Otham's canal spanned nearly 500 miles throughout what is now known as the Salt River Valley in central Arizona and supported up to 50,000 people. These days, another system is helping manage water in the area. A 700-acre wetland around the Salt River will reclaim and purify wastewater while restoring the natural environment. In this system, water flows from the city's existing wastewater treatment facilities into the Tres Rios Wetlands Wastewater Treatment treatment plant. Trace Rios then uses an ecosystem of plants, animals, soils, bacteria, and ultraviolet light from the sun to naturally filter wastewater. The elements of the wetland environment work together to reduce biological contaminants as well as nitrogen and phosphorus. This filtered, reclaimed water then gets pumped over the wetlands, allowing animal and plant life to use what they need. From there, excess water heads to a canal system that provides irrigation for non-food crop growth. The Trace Rios wetlands helps the city of Phoenix protect the quality of its water supply in a way that's sustainable. And this method is also being used around the world. Wetlands in Tianjin, China and Jinja, Uganda are both using nature to help clean wastewater to take care of the environment and provide more water for more people. Protecting our fresh water isn't gonna be any easier than fighting off the White Walkers. We can't force the hydrologic cycle to evenly distribute water around the planet. We can't stop growing food or get rid of sewage. There are no simple solutions, and we don't have any dragons to help us win the fight. What we can do is be aware of where our water's coming from, how we're using it, and where it goes next. And we can encourage and support decisions and efforts at every level and all along the river to make sure our fresh water stays fresh and that everyone has enough of it. If we do that, I'm pretty sure the results will be a lot more satisfying than the finale of Game of Thrones. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall sustainability course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment your thoughts on the Game of Thrones finale, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.